I am the Director of Programming for the Arkansas Arts and Fashion Forum. I'm excited that we are able to invite back Caitlin Draper-Matlin, who will be speaking today. She is an MSW LCSW ACAS. She's a psychotherapist who owns her own private practice in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She graduated with both her undergraduate and graduate degrees in social work from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And Caitlin specializes in autism spectrum disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and perinatal mental health. She holds the clinical credential of advanced autism specialist through the International Bureau of Credentialing and continuing education standards. Caitlin has also been practicing meditation for over 15 years. This presentation is not a substitute for therapy. Please call 911 immediately if you believe you're experiencing a mental health emergency. If you're experiencing stress, anxiety, or symptoms of depression, trauma, difficulty coping, or other mental health issues, we recommend you schedule an appointment with a local mental health care provider. Also, if you have any questions for Caitlin, you can direct them to me, Rachel Woody Pumford, if you're on the Zoom call, or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can comment any of your questions on the video or direct message them to the Arkansas Arts and Fashion Forum so we can maintain your anonymity when I ask the questions to Caitlin at the end. And again, you can send those at any time. We just ask that you direct chat them instead because it's a little easier for her to focus on speaking rather than having them pop up and ping her the whole time. But other than that, we're excited to get started. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've really been enjoying both attending and speaking at these. I think it's a really good resource for the community. So thanks for doing it, Rachel. Of course. Um, okay, so obviously today um, we're going to talk a little bit about coping skills with COVID. Um, there's a lot of stress, a lot of uncertainty. Um, it's really what we're experiencing is like a collective trauma. Um, so we're gonna talk about A, normalizing some of the things that you might be experiencing um, and ways to cope with them. We'll talk a little bit about mindfulness, um, radical acceptance. We'll talk about meditation uh, and some basic, basic coping skills that you can use every day um, to help you work through this. So I want to start by normalizing some things. Um, feel free to chat in anything that I'm missing. And Rachel, if you would just want to shout those out to me if I miss something. Um, but I want to normalize what you're experiencing right now. A lot of people are having COVID stress dreams. Um, I know that I am. I have dreams about going shopping with my friends and people aren't wearing a mask. And I'm you know, like, ah, and I get scared. Um, I had a dream about hugging my friends last night. Um, I'm like, oh, how nice would that be just to give a friend a hug? Um, so sleep issues are a big deal right now for a lot of people. And sleep, as we all know, directly impacts your mental health. Um, you're functioning at work, functioning within relationships. So um, that's a, a key thing that's difficult. Um, overspending, that's happening. Uh, a lot of people are overspending, um, drinking, substance abuse. Uh, if you are a tobacco user or a former tobacco user, user that can be um, something that you might be tempted to, to use again to help you cope. Um, health anxiety is another big one. Stressing about family that may catch COVID, stressing about friends, stressing about yourself. Um, so what are some of the things that you guys have been experiencing? Some other kind of... If everyone's comfortable with it, I'm happy to unmute the group where you have the option to unmute yourself. And so that way, if you would like to comment, Kayla, if you're comfortable with that, I'll yeah. add that in. And if you want to do it anonymously, then you can chat in or however you want to do it. So um, now have the ability to unmute themselves if they would like. Uh, while I kind of wait for some of those responses, I also want to acknowledge some of the other disasters that are happening right now. Um, I think climate change has caused a lot of uncertainty for people. Um, obviously, the um, Killing of um, black people all over the country has been horrific and um, 
I think it causes just a lot of discomfort. So um, anyone have any other symptoms? Yeah. Um, so we had two that came in. Um, someone added that they're experiencing difficulty coping with the stress of work in COVID. Mm -hmm. And then another one is the endless nature of the virus. It's just never ending. Yes. Um, especially coping with work. A lot of people are experiencing burnout, specifically those like in the healthcare, um, in the healthcare industry, and also people that are servicing us at the grocery store, um, people that are really having to work in the face of this. There have been a lot of assaults on um, workers. So in my practice, I've seen people that um, are scared for their physical safety going to work, and that's a big deal. That's a, that's a trauma. So I wanna make sure that we know, oh, FOMO, fear, yep. Um, of missing out or being left out. Uh, I have several friends right now that are going through some big, big life changes, having babies, um, getting married, graduating from this or that. And it's really hard not to be there in that way or experience those events in the way that you were maybe hoping. Um, so in this normalizing these things that are going on, you're not alone. It's, it's a thing and it's okay to feel that way. We'll talk about, um, how to cope and maybe less, uh, I don't know, less destructive ways, I would say. Um, but I also want to make sure that you know that you can experience these things and grieve them and it's okay. Grieving not being able to go to a baby shower or have a baby shower the way you want to. Grieving, missing dinners with friends out, just having that experience of, you know, the atmosphere of a restaurant. Um, those things are, are real and you're allowed to grieve them. Something that is not super helpful during these times is, um, trying to minimize your experience. For example, a lot of people say like, um, you know, oh yeah, but it's just going out to a restaurant. Like at least none of my family members have, you know, died from COVID. Like um, at least I haven't, um, I don't know, Chad, if you've got another example, but um, it can be both things. You can honestly miss going places, you can miss, you can grieve for your, your child who wasn't able to have a graduation party. Those are things that you look forward to, you know, throughout your child's existence or through, throughout your life. Um, we're all missing a lot of big milestones and ignoring that or minimizing it doesn't help. Um, so that's the first thing. I just wanted to normalize those emotions or experiences that you might be having. Um, that would be more on the experience side, but um, emotions that you might be feeling. Someone, um, oh, missing hugging, I know. I, I, had a, I had a dream about it last night. I miss hugging people. Um, and it's okay to grieve that, because like, as human beings, we're made for connection, and we all know this. Um, hugs are a way that we connect with, with our people, and it's really hard not doing that. But the feelings that you might be having are anger, anger at the situation, uh, anger at family members or friends that maybe think differently about the pandemic than you, um, anger at all of the systems that um, are failing us at this time. Um, there's just a lot. So sadness, fear, I just want to normalize those things as well. Um, but what do we do about it? So I'll start with some light coping skills. Um, we'll go into some deeper coping skills and then we'll do some question and answer. So does anyone have any other, like, I don't know, things that you're experiencing along the lines of like sleep issues, et cetera, or feelings that you've been having that are um, confusing or difficult. 
just kind of. I feel like I've personally not been sleeping as deeply lately. Like I feel like I wake up very easily. Whereas like that wasn't what it was like before. I feel like it's like just a stress thing. Like I'm on edge. I don't yes. know if anyone else in the group has had similar experience, but. Oh, and crying during meditation and prayer. Yeah. That's a big one too. Um, Rachel, I'll start with yours and then I'll move to the, to the crying. But um, I was reading the other day about why we might be experiencing so much um, like the depth of sleep issues that people are experiencing. Um, and one thing that people are theorizing is that, you know, when we sleep, that's one reason why a lot of people have anxiety when they go to bed or at night. Um, our defenses are lowered. We're very vulnerable. Um, and our brains aren't really good at deciphering. This is a threat that can kill me in my sleep. And this is a threat that I'm, I'm okay to sleep. So because we're all heightened and we're feeling the effects of, um, the pandemic, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. Like, it's just a horrible, huge thing, right? Um, it can be difficult for people to sleep, so they're not sleeping as deeply. They're having nightmares. Um, and these are all symptoms of trauma. Um, big time, so. The crying during meditation and prayer, that is so, so okay. It's also okay to have emotions all over the place, to be totally fine one day. Um, and to not be fine the next. So with the crime piece, I wanna talk, that's a great segue, into some radical acceptance. So radical acceptance is the idea that resisting our feelings actually creates suffering. And it's true. So this is one reason why people struggle with substance abuse or any sort of dis distressing behavior. Kleptomania. Um, overspending because we're, tr we're trying to not feel the way that we really feel. Um, so practicing radical acceptance can be a real um, existential experience. I don't, I don't know. I'm better when I'm talking to people, it feels weird. Just like, I was just gonna say, I completely agree with okay. what you just said. It, yeah, definitely existential, for sure. Right? And it's something that you feel like it shouldn't have to be that way. But yeah, I just have to say that. I completely agree. Thank you, DJ. I, yeah. it's, um, it's real. And when I say existential, I mean, existential um, refers to the givens of human existence. So like death, freedom, suffering, joy, pain, those things that we as humans are all going to experience. Um, being in this pandemic, we're really forced to face these things. What really matters to us? Um, what, what is important in our lives? What do we wanna be doing? Uh, what do we miss the most? What are things that we didn't realize that we um, really enjoyed doing? like hugging until we couldn't. Um, so radical acceptance is about accepting those things without making them, without making you feel worse. For example, let's say that um, I am feeling frustrated by schools reopening and I'm feeling really scared because I don't know what that's gonna mean, right? Um, I can push that, that thought away. Like, well, it doesn't matter. I don't have kids. I'm not going to school. What do I care? Um, I can dwell on it and sit in suffering, you know, kind of like, oh my God, what are we going to do? I'm so angry. Uh, but by human nature, I'm probably not going to want to be there too long. So I might look to things to help me self-soothe and some of those things might not be so helpful. For, I mean, I'm going to just bring up the same things like drinking. Um, people that have struggled with disordered eating um, are also struggling because that's something that you do to help you feel control. But the whole point of radical acceptance is accepting that we don't have control and that that's okay. 
Um, so instead of maybe overspending or drinking or whatever else makes me feel good to self soothe in a way that's destructive, I can use the tool Rain, which I talked about last time, but I'm going to run through again. Um, to help me accept what it is that I'm feeling in the situation that I'm in without making it worse. So the R in RAIN stands for recognize. So I'm going to recognize how I'm feeling. I'm going to put feeling words on it. So in this case, if I'm talking about being frustrated that schools are reopening, um, I'm recognizing right now that I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling maybe alone. Take whatever situation you're experiencing. Um, maybe I'm feeling disconnected. Hmm. Yeah, all those things. Resentful that I have to work during this pandemic. You know, whatever it is for you, um, recognize that you're feeling that. Uh, the A is for allow. So we're going to allow those feelings to be there. Uh, there's a story that Tara Brock shares in her book, Radical Acceptance, about the Buddha. And he's traveling through India with his friend, and his arch nemesis is in the woods. And so Buddha's friend is like, oh my god, Buddha, there's your enemy. Like, we got to get out of here. Let's run. And Buddha says, no, we don't need to run. We don't need to run from him. He's there, and we need to accept it. So let's invite him for tea. Let's have him sit with us and um, experience that discomfort because it's going to go away. And so they did. So I physically will say out loud sometimes or remind myself like, let's just let, let's invite this feeling in. Let's let it sit for tea, right? Um, instead of pushing it away, not wanting to feel it, you know, nope, I'm not going to feel sad about this or I've just got so much to be grateful for. Well, you do, but you're also sad and disconnected and whatever it is that you're feeling. Um, so once we allow, we allow those feelings to be there. We, I, investigate. So R-A-I. We investigate why we might be feeling that way. Um, let's say that you are feeling resentful about working. I have a lot of friends working in the school systems that are very upset, they're frustrated and scared. Um, friends that have been attacked while working at Walmart. Um, you know, those things you would probably feel resentful. Um, once you recognize what it is that you're feeling and you allow those feelings to be there, investigating in that situation might look like you know, why should I be resentful? I have a job, at least I have a job during these times. But wait, if I'm working during these times, probably I've got a tough job. Um, probably I am having to put my health and safety at risk, or I'm putting my mental health at risk by staying at home constantly and working. Um, yeah, I can understand why I might be feeling resentful. Uh, then you in nurture yourself with loving kindness. And that looks like, what if I don't judge myself for feeling that way? What if, even if it feels wrong, what if I let myself experience that uh, emotion and let's see if it passes. And generally, most of the time, it takes practice. But when you walk through those steps, you recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture, the feeling transforms. Also, while you're investigating, it's important to remember that your feelings are information. They're not fact, but they're information and worthy of being investigated. So, you know, um, if I'm feeling scared about returning back to school, you know, I'm upset, I've investigated. Something else to bring into your investigation is like, um, I don't know, working toward understanding of your emotions. 
So one other thing I wanted to mention in the investigation piece is investigating um, where you're feeling those feelings in your body. Often we register physical emotions before we, or physical sensations of our emotions before we recognize the emotion. That can look like your chest feeling tight, your stomach dropping or you feeling nauseous. Um, some people will feel like they're getting a headache, tension. It's really important as you're recognizing and allowing and investigating to bring your body into that too, because your body can give you a lot of information. So any questions about that? I actually had one. Yeah. Um, I love that you described sitting with uncomfortable feelings as inviting them to come sit for tea. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a really good reminder because it's hard to want to sit with the bad feelings and like feel that discomfort. You'd rather just like rush through it and like move on. Like you don't want to sit in the down feelings. You want to get up to the next up. And that's the thing I see a lot in like hustle culture. I feel like mm, yeah. as a millennial, I see a lot of other millennials who just are always on the move. Like if you pause and take a breath, like you'll fall behind and everyone's just going to like move past you and you'll feel like you need to catch up and just have to hustle harder. So in addition to rain, are there some other ways that we can intentionally slow ourselves down to make that time to process and sit with those feelings so we can recognize what's going on, investigate what's going on in our own bodies? Yes. Um, I'm working on, on my arms. I just feel like it's such a natural, um, like, so something else, the whole thing is putting space in between the feeling and the reaction, right? If you're having trouble in a relationship, uh, likely you're feeling something and react immediately out of anger or sadness. Maybe you immediately withdraw. You can't, that's when we sort of feel out of control. In these COVID times, that feeling might look like, um, I don't know, who's got an example? Feeling, feeling frustrated maybe and having a nasty thought about someone on Facebook, let's say. Uh, so a few other ways that we can put space in between the feeling and the action would be using some physical um, self-soothing tools. There was a study done by the Cochrane Group. I don't know. I think it was maybe 2009. But basically what happened was they had a group of veterans that there was a control group and there was an experimental group. They essentially exposed the veterans to trauma, to a trigger. Um, half the group, the control group, did not get anything. The experimental group got a um, peppermint. So as they underwent, so they went through functional MRI, which kind of helps um, examine the electrical activity in our brain. Um, they realized that, so 86%, I think it was 86%, um, something in the high 80s percent of people in the experimental group avoided a panic attack or a flashback. When they felt triggered, they had the peppermint, and they avoided a flashback or a panic attack. Um, and of course in the control group, it wasn't, I don't know how many people avoided, but it wasn't very many um, by using other techniques. So one reason why, um, why the peppermint works is because it involves all of our five senses, taste, smell, touch, it's really crunchy, smells strong, striking in color with the white and the red. Um, so there's a lot going on there and it helps distract your brain. So we can use smaller techniques um, in our day-to-day -day lives. One thing that I love to do, I have a gigantic cat and I love to sit him on my chest and use that as a mindfulness exercise. Um, so what did I, what can I notice about his coat, his little fur coat that I hadn't noticed before? Um, 
what does his purr sound like? How am I feeling when I hear him purr? Um, you know, if I look into his eyes, is there like something I, I haven't noticed before about the color of his eyes? Um, grounding yourself in that way can help give you space to cope with those feelings differently. I hope that's making sense. Are there any questions about that so far? We actually have a couple questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, would you mind speaking more about nurturing yourself? Specifically, I have a hard time being able to self-nurture, especially while at work when I don't have time to do so and have no support around me. Any tips? Yes. So visualization is a really, really good technique to help you learn how to nurture yourself. Tara Brock in the book talks about um, you can use things like a departed loved one kind of as an external source of nurturing and support. Some people use white light, thinking about white light surrounding you. Um, maybe it's a pet or a friend that's alive that you can visualize um, nurturing you and surrounding you. Um, and there's a technique from a theoretical perspective in therapy called internal family systems. Um, and one thing that you can visualize, which I actually love, is like your younger self, your child self, and you can imagine nurturing that, that little you. Um, like you can, if you externalize this and someone was telling you about um, why they were feeling upset, why COVID is really stressful for them, they're with their kids all day long, or, you know, everyone has a unique COVID experience, but wouldn't you understand? Like, yeah, that's a lot to deal with. Or staying home, feeling isolated, um, not being able to go on those trips or do things. Some people feel like they're losing a year of their life. Like, I can understand that, right? Um, so you approach yourself with that same kind of loving acceptance that you would from someone, if someone were telling you that, that story. So visualization, white light, um, one, another thing I like to do is if you touch the insides of your wrists here, like your forearm, it's a really soft area. It's got probably a lot of nerve endings. I don't know. Um, I'm not a doctor, but it's soft and it feels really good. So when I want to self-soothe and I want to nurture myself, I want to have compassion for what I'm feeling. I'll often just kind of sit in that for a moment because it, it's nice and it's it's an act of compassion and then we have another two questions um the first one was what was the title of the book was it radical acceptance so there are two books from um tara brock t-a-r-a b-r-a-c-h and she's just wonderful but the first book her oldest book is radical acceptance and in that, she talks um, just a lot more about accepting your feelings and emotions. One tool, like she describes, I think, in the book, it might be in one of her podcasts, but um, is saying yes to your feelings. So when you're having a hard time accepting them, this might sound weird, but in your head or out loud, you can say, yes, fear. Okay, yes, frustration. Yes, loneliness. And you say yes to those feelings to help you learn how to invite them over for tea. Um, and then the second, her other book is Radical Compassion. And that just came out and it's phenomenal and it's all about rain. So it goes into detail about rain. It's about how to have compassion for yourself and others at the same time. So. And then the next question is, do you feel as though participating in hustle culture and not sitting with those feelings adds to anxiety? not participating in hustle culture or, so oh. you are participating in hustle culture and then hustle culture is yes sorry if i make the question a little difficult no it's okay so you're participating in it yes so basically um whenever you going back to where you were talking about not really sitting with those feelings but and rachel spoke about we're like as millennials we're like always like 
you know, we feel like we have to do a million and one things to possibly either please people or ourselves or to be involved in the next thing. Whenever we're going through that, I, at least I can speak for myself. I feel like sometimes um, things, I can get a little anxious and I'm wondering if basically not taking the time to, to like acknowledge those feelings, well, does it heighten the anxiety more versus in just like not paying attention to those feelings? If that, oh, if that yeah. makes sense, I hope it does. Yes, that makes sense. That okay. makes sense. So when you acknowledge the feelings mm -hmm. that come with participating in the culture that we're kind of like in a lot of ways forced to, which is part of the problem, um, by not acknowledging those feelings, we repress or we suppress, we minimize, we say, everybody else is doing it, I should be able to do it too. When you say should about yourself, you're implying judgment. Um, and I think if we learn to love ourselves a little bit more, we can learn to love our fellow brothers and sisters in humanity a little more as well. So no one should be doing anything. You know, you could, I like to re replace it with could, um, but we definitely all feel like we should. Um, you know, for me, I don't post on Instagram very much. I just am not like a phone person. I don't like my phone. It kind of stresses me out. But I love my friends. So sometimes when I'm scrolling through Instagram, looking at other people's, I'm like, I should be posting more, you know? I should be, I should be doing that. Um, but I'm not. And I could, but... But I'm not. So anyway, when you repress, it comes back up in different ways. And we're experiencing then like more and more and more discomfort and we don't know why. Um, and then we're more likely to turn to things that are destructive to help us cope with and soothe those, those things. But when you do acknowledge it, you don't want to live there. That's why we talk like inviting it for tea. You're not having it move in. You know, you're just allowing it to sit with you for a few minutes. Um, so what that can look like is you're feeling really anxious. You're reading a book, let's say, and for some reason, the whole weight of the world comes down. You're like, oh my God, election. Oh my God, COVID. Everything is happening at once. This is really, really scary. Um, am I going to have a job in a year? How am I going to pay my bills next month? Okay. I recognize I'm feeling really anxious right now. And I might close my book. And just kind of lay there and think, I'll grab my cat and lay there and think, um, you know, I acknowledge what it is that I'm feeling. Um, and I allow it to be there. I, I investigate it and I nurture. And then I might sit there for a minute and really like, this is a wave. This is a wave of emotion. It's temporary. It's not going to be here forever. Just let it have some tea. Okay, I'm gonna continue reading. I can read and be sad. I can read and be anxious. I can read and call a friend. I can be anxious and call a friend. Probably, I mean, you can read and call a friend. I don't know how well that would work. But um, does that make sense? Any questions about that? And did I answer your question? Yes, you definitely answered it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, so, if anyone in the group has any questions, you're also welcome to jump in anytime or message and we can put a pause in for you. All right. So Rachel, you said that you had a few things. Yeah. So here. before the talk, we were talking, uh, Kayla and I were talking about how schools are reopening and that there's a wide range of emotions that families are feeling, especially kids. So some kids are very excited. They haven't seen their friends now in months and they're ready to get back to the class. So excited, great. And then there are other kids who have been told for the last five months that like everything outside is scary, right? Like you can't go outside without a mask. You have to wash your hands all the time. You have to sanitize, don't touch anything, you know? And it can be overwhelming to a child, especially if they don't have the vocabulary to understand their emotions. Like they don't know what they're feeling, but they know it's scary and they just feel bad and don't know how to express themselves. What are some coping skills that kids can be using to help cope 
or like get into a morning routine to get ready for school so it's not scary or ways to like calm down after school where they come in and it's like it's a routine it's safe ways where they can you know trust their teachers and their peers and try to help out because i know that when kids do feel afraid that they're more likely to act out in class which then causes problems which then can cause more problems because now they're acting out at school and just like ways to try to like ease the transition from five months of quarantine to going back to school? Um, that's an excellent question. And like I told you, I am definitely not an expert on children. I see almost exclusively adults in my practice, but um, the things that studies have shown already that are effective for kids in distress um, are so much almost the same as things that help adults. So sticking to a routine is very important. Whatever that looks like for you, creating some kind of um, sense of normality, not, not talking about it. So we want to talk about it and we want to normalize our kiddos' feelings or our own feelings. Um, we also might want to ask, like, how are you feeling? I don't want to assume, like, you know, Tina, I bet you're having a lot of feelings right now. How are you feeling about going back to school? Um, and when someone tells you how they're feeling, you don't want to respond with, oh, well, no, it's going to be okay. No, 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 it's going to be fine. Or um, some sort of, when you respond in that way, it cuts people off and makes them feel shut down. So often. So what you want to do is um, ask more questions. So like, oh, I don't know, I'm excited, but um, I'm also really scared. Yeah, I bet. What are you scared about? What are you excited about? Um, we do the same things again with adults, but asking questions and, and validating statements. I can imagine why you feel that way. Yeah, that does sound scary. I didn't have to go through that on my first day of kindergarten. You know, meeting your teacher over the computer, that's weird. You know, are you nervous about being able to sit still? How are you feeling about this? So asking questions. Um, it's really hard, I think right now for parents to have all of the emotional energy and space that they want for their children. Um, Cause when you're having to teach them and you're having to maybe work at home and you're having to this and that and like, maybe money's tight right now. Um, but I think the smallest gestures can make a big difference in talking to your kids about why, like your, their parent might not be so engaged. Like, Hey, you know, I really want to do something fun with you. So, but I'm also really tired. You know, this is very difficult for all of us. I'm going to sit next to you and I'm going to do this. I'm going to catch up on my emails or I'm going to look at Pinterest or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and I'm going to sit next to you while you color and you can talk to me and whatever, but something fun. If you can do something really fun, great. Like, I don't know, making sock puppets. I don't know what kids do. Great. Like having some fun in your schedule is really important. Um, but if you just cannot do it that day, that's okay too. Do what you can. Um, no, I think that was, that would be what I would say. Ask questions. Yeah. And then another question that I had um, regarding families is I know that a lot of times when people have kids, they stop having as many of their own friends. It tends to be like their kids' parents or their friends. And so this time would be particularly isolating if your kids aren't getting together for soccer practice. You might not feel like you have that support system. And so we started off this whole conversation talking about destigmatizing mental health. And I think that's something millennials in particular, we've tried to do our best of destigmatizing getting mental health help and having the coping skills we need to deal with challenges as we approach. But telehealth is a new thing. And so I know that a lot of people don't make excuses to not get mental health help or see a therapist because you know it's an hour appointment and you have to take an hour off work, but you also have to drive there and drive back and suddenly you've wasted two hours of your day and you've got all those meetings and emails and Zoom calls. Can you talk a little bit about 
the accessibility of telehealth? Yes. Um, so at the end, I'll kind of list off some very basic, like, coping things that you can find anywhere online, um, but that are helpful to know. One of those things is connection and support. So first I'll talk about how to connect in a time you're not really able to connect in person. Um, and then we'll segue into mental health care. So the first thing that I would like to invite you to do, um, there is a coping during COVID virtual support group. Um, and I'm trying to, I don't see, it's a therapist named Tyler. And I don't know if he's doing it in his own practice or if it's in a group practice or what, but um, I'm gonna give you the details if you would like them and I'll send this little graphic to Rachel so she can post it. Um, but it's Thursday evenings from six to 7.30. Um, it's for people ages 24 and older and it's $20 a session. So the email address is in there and I'll again forward that to you, Rachel. Um, there's also meetup.com. I think a lot of those groups, you can find groups that you're interested in. I think a lot of them are doing virtual meetings. It's, I think sometimes we think ourselves out of what's really good for us. So sometimes when I suggest these things to people, they're like, yeah, that sounds really good. But it's really hard to follow up on that when you might be feeling depressed and lacking energy or anxious and lacking energy. Being, I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing like fatigue from being on the computer all day. Um, it can be really exhausting. But my advice to you would be that the, the benefit, well, my encouragement for you would be that the benefits of connection, um, meeting people, having support during this time, like way outweigh the cons, which might be, I'm stressed, I'm feeling scared about it. I don't, I don't know, it's gonna be dumb or whatever. Just connect, do what you can to connect. Um, and you might have to get creative. But if you're interested in a topic, I'm sure there are lots of other people that are interested too in our area. Um, and you can start your own meetup and see see what happens virtually. So that's the first thing. But I think there's even a stigma for reaching out. Like people, some people think that like those sort of groups are lame. I've heard people say they're lame or they're whatever. Um, so there's stigma in that, but there's so much stigma in mental health care. I have heard people, I don't like the word crazy. Um, Cause I think it's not, it's not a thing, it's excitement maybe, you're like, woo, I'm crazy about Taco Bell, something like that, but not necessarily like, it's not how we should ever describe somebody's behavior or um, their feelings. So I've heard so many people say though, like, I'm not crazy, I don't need a, I don't need a, a therapist. Therapy is a way for you to learn more about yourself to heal from the things in the past that have hurt you and to help you move forward into a future that looks like, that is more consistent with what you want for your life. Um, but there are all kinds of therapists. So in my practice, most of the time I roll up in leggings or I wanna be comfortable because if my pants are too tight, I can't really think that, that great, I get distracted. Um, so my, my approach is very, very casual, but there are some people that are like, oh, you're wearing flip-flops. Like that means you're not taking this seriously. Well, there are therapists for you too then. There are people that, you know, it's a much more formal setting or whatever. Um, but I, I say that therapy is like dating. You might have to hop around until you find the person that you connect with. Um, but yeah, you can judge a little bit by like their profile. We'll talk about how to find people. Um, but a lot of times you just have to, to meet with them. I like to give therapists like two sessions. And if I'm not feeling it, 
and I'll bounce and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we are trained not to get our feelings hurt by that. Our goal is for you to get what you need. And you know, if that is going to come from someone else, that's totally fine. Like you, you do you. Um, so in Northwest Arkansas, the most popular way to find a therapist is by psychologytoday.com. So you can either Google psychologytoday.com or, um, I don't know, you can just go to the website. Um, you can type in your zip code and just, they will populate a huge list of a bunch of us. We, and there are like little profiles and they talk about our specialties and things we're comfortable with seeing. So some people might really want like, there's all kinds of counseling too, like a secular, um, some people might need a secular counselor. Some people might need um, someone that's LGBTQIA plus affirming, or they might want a Christian counselor or a counselor that focuses in this. So you can find and narrow down um, based on your needs but therapy is expensive. So a lot of times your insurance will cover it. Um, if you are uninsured or underinsured, if you have huge deductibles, you can also ask um, or put a qualifier on there for therapists with a sliding scale and they will adjust the price of your therapy based on your income. So there is free therapy um, there's $5 therapy. So at Cardinal Care Center in Farmington, they have counseling interns that see people, um, last I checked it was $5 a session that might have changed. So, um, highly recommend you looking at that, but all you have to do is reach out, start a conversation with them. If you can't afford it, ask them where they can direct you because most of us have hearts for helping um, people to connect with what they need. Did that answer your question, Rachel? And I actually um, ask a question before we get off of that. Um, yeah. So what do you say to yourself whenever you have like something positive like in front of you, like the links? like for like psychology today, but you just don't have the energy to do it. So for me, one thing that's usually what my mind thinks of, like let's say when I wanna go exercise or I know I need to, I just, just like, I don't even put any thought into it. I just make myself get up and go do it because the more I think about it, the less likely I'll be able, be willing to do it. And so I guess, actually, I should have phrased my question like this. Let's say you have someone else in your life who you're trying to get to, I guess, seek therapy. Like, what do you do? Like, whenever you have the tools in front of, you put the tools in front of them, but, you know, they're just in that low space, unfortunately, to where the simplest task can seem kind of daunting. So do you have any advice or anything? Yes. Um, that's a really excellent question. And it's something that I hear a lot from my clients and I've experienced too. I think we've all experienced this. Um, but there's this idea um, in a realm of therapy called DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, the dialectics means that two things that seem like they are opposites can both be true at the same time. So when we get really depressed, often everything goes to shit and we don't um we don't want to clean our house we don't sometimes don't want to shower or brush our teeth or um drink water everything feels like it takes so much energy um we can be tired and we can do the things that we need to do to help support ourselves and um our wellness or it can be um, that you, two things can be true. I want to do this, I want to get a counselor, but I'm feeling really, really anxious. And I'm feeling like I don't wanna reach out. Um, and the list goes on and on. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, like socializing, I wanna do it so bad because I miss all my friends. 
Um, but for some reason, it's like there's this anxiety. I feel like I'm going to be awkward or something. Um, you know, but both of those can be true at the same time. And I can choose, even if it doesn't feel this way. And this is where you can add those coping skills to put space. So, um, you know, if I'm feeling really overwhelmed or I'm about to go see a friend and I'm overwhelmed, I can put some essential oils on my wrist and smell and just kind of work on calming myself, focusing on the smell, popping a peppermint, um, rubbing my arm. Like there are lots of things you can do to put space in between those things. Um, but once you have the space, then you can choose to act differently. So in that DBT, there's a skill called opposite action. And it's literally just doing the opposite of what you want to do. Um, but you weigh the pros and cons. So like, let's say um, you want to find a therapist, but literally it's been on your list of things to do for two weeks. And it's like, call the therapist, make an appointment. And you just feel like you can't. Like it's just not happening for you. Um, you can weigh the pros and cons of acting on that behavior. So what would be the pros? Okay, if I acted on that behavior and I did not call the therapist, the pros would be I wouldn't have to do it. Um, I could keep watching my show on Netflix. I could, I wouldn't have to talk about my feelings. So those are the pros of not calling the therapist. The cons would be I continue to suffer. I feel defeated. Um, And I continue to be kind of stuck in this cycle. Um, when you weigh those out, maybe for you right now, Netflix wins. Let it happen. Like there's an element of trusting yourself um, that you know when it's time for you to get help and that you will do it. And when that pressure comes off, then we're often able to like, okay, I can, I can call those people. I can do that. Um, yeah, but obviously acting on the opposite of what you want to do in that situation, not calling because you're anxious. I can be anxious and call a therapist. And I know that th those benefits are going to be very helpful uh, in my life. Um, but as far as like trying to help other people, that's where our boundaries have to come in. You can give people information. You can help them in any way that you can support them but you can't make them do something, you know, and trying to only drains your emotional energy. It's just a, it's a boundary issue. So you just, you want to lead them, give them the information they need and it's their decision. You want to empower them in that way. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. And one thing that popped into my head when you said that at the very beginning of uh, essential oils and peppermints, I thought about, creating a sort of like let's get down to business or like a care package to help someone get to get you know what I mean fill out that application you know what I mean things like that I I yeah I think that on the same wavelength mm -hmm. I totally that's a great 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 point um I talk to people about having a kit with them mm. And it can be like so small. Um, this is on my, or in my kit, and it's a squishy. So if I'm feeling super anxious, yeah, and I'm a nail biter. So when I'm noticing, hey, am I anxious? I'm biting my nails. Like, well, let me, let me grab this guy. A, it's so cute. It's colorful. It feels nice. It kind of makes a little sound when you squish it. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a sensory thing that, can help give me space between my anxiety and the behavior of by my nails. So, um, yeah, having a little kit with you, peppermints, squishy, some kind of sensory thing, um, pictures of people you love, those are all good. Fabulous, thank you so much. You're welcome. In closing, I just wanna straight up list some of those things that I was talking about that can really help during COVID and the dealing with the uncertainty. Um, limiting your news intake, I think is important. I was 
catching up on my COVID slash government slash all the news that was horribly depressing right before bed. And I was having problems sleeping. And I was like, I don't know why. This is really weird. And as I start looking at um, my routine in bed, I'm scrolling through, you know, NPR or CNN or whatever you like to look at. Um, and that's not cool. So now I do that in the morning and I have like a 20 minutes that I gave myself to look at the news and catch up and then I'm done and I have to be done. So that's number one. Um, making sure that your news is coming from a reputable source is also very important because um, there are a lot of mean people out there that want to profit on our fear. Um, and so yeah, just make sure you're getting it from a legitimate source. Facebook is probably not the best way to get your news. Um, so you might want to avoid that. The other thing as far as that goes is to do your very best to limit, um, social networking sites. Like, uh, I have been so scrolling Instagram, like an hour. I could scroll it for an hour. I really could. Um, I just like to look at stuff, you know? And however, there's a huge element of FOMO. Um, it, it's just, it's, there are lots of studies that suggest that it's not good for your mental health. So limiting that to X amount of time per day, whatever you're comfortable with, maybe like deduct a little bit from what you're comfortable with. So again, mine's like 20 minutes now. Um, I would like for it to be 30, but it's not. Um, so that's one thing. Making sure as best as you can that you're following a routine that helps support your mind and body, moving your body and exercise or gardening. Um, you know, if you have some physical limitations, there are so many cool YouTube channels. Um, there are ways that you can exercise from a wheelchair. There are ways that you can exercise um, with your shoulder. I mean, just whatever you can do, there are ways to do it. There are adaptations. So. And seeking connection, I think is the most important thing. Seek connection with your friends, family. Also, forgive yourself if you don't feel like talking to someone or people for a day. I have straight up days where I, I, my phone is at the opposite end of my house. So, and that's okay. I'm gonna let that happen because it's what I need. I think that's it. Any other questions? Anything else I didn't get to? All right. Well, thank you, Caitlin, for joining us. I really appreciate you coming back. It was wonderful hearing that other people are going through similar things right now with COVID and this unexpectedly long quarantine that doesn't currently have an end in sight. It's good to know that we have some skills and tools for our toolbox to use to help us keep strong and, you know, not isolate while we're socially distancing. Yes. Well, thank you everyone. We will have this video uploaded onto YouTube and then in the next few days, but it's also up on Facebook if you want to watch anything and take any notes that you might have missed. We appreciate you all for coming. Thank you for having me. Have a good evening. All right, you too. Bye.